Early in the morning of March 4, 2002, a joint special operations reconnaissance team was tasked to insert onto the mountaintop of Takur Gar by way of an MH-47 Chinook, report enemy movements, and direct airstrikes. Among them was Technical Sergeant John Chapman, a U.S. Air Force combat controller. At approximately 2.50 in the morning, the MH-47 helicopter carrying Sergeant Chapman and the Joint Special Operations Team was ambushed as it attempted to land on the mountaintop. The Chinook was rocked by RPG fire, knocking Petty Officer First Class Neil Roberts from the helicopter and into the frigid and unforgiving terrain of a snowy mountaintop named Takur Gar. We watched the helicopter uh, move off of uh, my right shoulder over to the, uh, from the west, moving south, um, infilled, and as soon as it sat down on top of the mountaintop, um, we saw the RPG strike the aircraft, um, and then the aircraft uh, move towards the uh, valley. We heard, uh, mayday, 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 any grim, any nail, this is Mako 3-0. I got partnered up with a crew for an AC-130H uh, Spectre gunship. On board, I was a direct support operator, uh, which was a, an extra sensor that was there for surveillance and support to ground forces and the aircraft itself. We established radio contact with them and set up an initial orbit over the down helicopter. When we were doing that, uh, we learned from Mako 30 uh, Tech Sergeant John Chapman, their combat controller. Sergeant Chapman, uh, at that point, was telling us uh, that they had lost a teammate. Alone against the elements and separated from his team with enemy personnel closing in, Roberts was in desperate need of support. Despite having to make a controlled crash landing eight kilometers away back at Gardez, the team elected to mount an immediate and daring rescue attempt to bring Roberts back. At 4.57 a.m. after reconstituting, the team returned to Takar Gar on another Chinook in order to locate and rescue Roberts, despite knowing they were headed into enemy territory and struggling against unfavorable conditions. These guys knew that they were going right back into the same spot that their original aircraft was shot up and they lost a teammate out of the back end of the helicopter. So uh, these guys, uh, they, they knew what, what, uh, what risk they were facing and they charged right back in there to save one of their very own. Upon touching down, Sergeant Chapman immediately identified and engaged a concealed enemy bunker in front and above his team. He charged that initial bunker uh, and then from there, uh, what my aircraft commander described as the firefight in a phone booth uh, just unfolded. Chapman assaulted through and cleared the bunker, killing two enemy combatants. Sergeant Chapman moved into the open to engage the second enemy bunker and protect his teammates. Chapman was struck and critically injured by enemy fire. We saw tracer fire, uh, mortars, uh, explosions, RPGs. I, I mean, there was, there was a lot of activity. Next thing you know, uh, the, the team uh, pops smoke and they start to withdraw from the immediate area and we're, we're following the, the team uh, from the initial uh, infill site and, and where their, their fighting positions were as they, uh, as they broke contact a couple hundred meters uh, down the mountain. So as all of this was going on, um, our, our sensor on board saw a, a completely separate uh, IR strobe uh, come active. So Mako 3-0, the main element, had, had withdrawn a couple hundred meters but all of a sudden at the, at the original point, there was an IR strobe active again. When you go back and look at, at the, the culmination of all of the sensor footages uh, that we didn't have access to on board the aircraft or uh, in the immediate aftermath, uh, it became absolutely clear that it was Tech Sergeant John Chapman. We were located approximately uh, three and a half to four clicks just north of the mountaintop, approximately about 10,000 to 11,000 feet up. At the time, I believed that there were two separate uh, 
um, elements, one that had gone down uh, or had moved down the mountaintop, and there was another element that was on top of the mountain continuing to fight in that bunker uh, location. Sustaining a violent engagement with multiple enemy personnel, and despite severe wounds, Sergeant Chapman continued to fight relentlessly. Throughout the next hour, the enemy bombarded Chapman's bunker position with machine gun fire, rocket-propelled grenades, and flanking movements. I was the lead combat controller, JTAC, with the Quick Reaction Force. Two will get lost service members. Sun was coming up. It was just about dawn. We did one pass over the mountaintop, and on that second pass, we began to flare to land, and that is when we received heavy RPG and small arms fire. At 6.11 a.m., with the QRF helicopter quickly approaching, Sergeant Chapman placed himself in a precarious position by leaving the bunker and moving into the open once again to engage the RPG team preparing to assault the incoming rescue force. Effective enemy machine gun fire struck Chapman. This time, Chapman's final desperate attempt to defeat the enemy would result in his death. He sacrificed himself for the, for the QRF that came in. I think if John Chapman had not been alive at that, that day, at that moment, the outcome of the insertion of the helicopter I was in with the QRF may have been drastically different. Um, by him being there and laying suppressive fire in that position, as we were flaring to land, absolutely uh, reduced the amount of rounds the enemy was able to put into the side of the helicopter. Uh, he volunteered to go back after he had landed, back at Gardez. Uh, he didn't have to go, um, and he did it because he loved what he did. Um, he loved his country, and that I'll never forget.